Today I'm going to be overclocking a stock Raspberry Pi 4B as far as possible before it gives up. I decided to try this after I accidentally increased the clock speed of this particular board to 2.2GHz instead of the 2GHz I usually use. It booted up just fine, and I only noticed that it was running at 2.2GHz when I ran a stress test a while later. The stock speed of a Raspberry Pi 4 Model B board like this is 1.5GHz, but it is fairly common for people to overclock them a little with adequate cooling. For a while the maximum limit was 2.147GHz, and that's why I was surprised when the board booted at 2.2GHz. I then did some reading, and found out that this limit seems to have been removed on newer models like the Compute Module 4, the Pi 400, and the 8GB variant of the Pi 4B, most likely because they've got an upgraded power management integrated circuit. It looks like quite a few people have managed to overclock their 8GB Pi 4Bs up to around 2.2 to 2.3GHz before running into issues. So today we're going to try overclocking this 8GB Pi 4 in a few increments, until it starts behaving weirdly just won't boot anymore or has a hardware failure. I'm going to be monitoring the internal temperatures in software and the component temperatures with a thermal camera. So I'm hoping that we reach a boot or lockup limit rather than having a hardware failure. Raspberry Pis are still quite hard to come by, so I'd prefer not to destroy this one. To monitor the component temperatures, I'm going to be using the new P2 Pro by Infiray. This is a new tiny thermal camera that weighs just 9 grams and plugs into an iOS or Android smartphone, turning it into a high resolution thermal camera with a range of color palettes. And don't let its size fool you, compared to other entry level thermal cameras, and even well known smartphone attached thermal cameras, this camera gives you around 2.5 times the resolution, 2.5 times the refresh rate, and up to 4 times the measurement range. The P2 Pro also has a trick up its sleeve. Not only does it have a typical wide angle lens for looking at large objects a short distance away, but it also includes this magnetic macro lens. This snaps onto the front of the camera and lets you see amazing detail close up, like inspecting small components on a PCB. Infrared is a large thermal imaging company that released their first thermal sensor back in 2015. So while this is a new product in their lineup, they have a wide range of industrial products and they've been around for a number of years. To start off, let's get some results from a stock Pi 4B running at the base frequency of 1.5GHz. From past experience, I already know that the Pi 4 runs into thermal throttling really quickly if you don't use a heatsink, so I'm going to use a standard stick-on heatsink for this first test. For each frequency, we're going to run a quick stress test to check that the CPU can actually handle being fully loaded. This will also show us the CPU temperature during the test, so we can keep an eye on the thermals. We'll then also run a sysbench benchmark to get a numerical value which we can use to compare the performance of the Pi. From this first test, it's pretty obvious that we're going to need better cooling. Not even a minute into the test and we're already well over 70 degrees so increasing the clock speed by even a small amount is going to push us into thermal throttling. Even so, I ran the sysbench benchmark and got a total number of events of 785. To provide additional cooling, I'm going to use an ice cube cooler. I've used one of these in many of my builds, and I know they do a really good job. I prefer the Sunfounder ice cube over an ice tower, as the cooling plate extends to cover the RAM, USB and Ethernet controller chips surrounding the CPU and not just the CPU itself. I'm also going to use thermal paste between the CPU and the cooler to improve thermal conductivity, so we're hopefully not limited by inadequate cooling in any of the tests. Now let's get the Pi booted up and see what improvements has been made by adding the ice cube cooler. Running the stress test, we can see our CPU clock frequency is sitting at 1.5GHz. And after a minute, the temperature stabilizes at around 34 degrees, so the ice cube cooler is working well. This is half of what we were at with the standard heatsink. You'll notice on the thermal camera that the fins on the cooler, as well as the arms and even the ports on the Pi are all similar to the background temperature. This is because metals are reflective and essentially behave like a mirror reflecting all of the surrounding infrared radiation. We can however still see the base of the ice cube cooler around the CPU, 
which is the area we're interested in. Running Sysbench, we get a total number of events of 813. This is a slight improvement over the standard heatsink, which is surprising given that we weren't near the thermal throttling limit of the Pi. Now let's increase the clock speed to 2 GHz and reboot the Pi. Running the stress test, after a minute the temperature has now reached 37 degrees, so we've got a 3 degree increase over the base frequency, which honestly isn't much. On Sysbench we get 1031 events, so an increase of over 25%, which is great. Next let's step it up to 2.2 GHz. For this I'm also going to increase over voltage to 10. This adjusts the core CPU voltage to accommodate the higher clock speeds. At 2.2 GHz we get a slight temperature increase of 2 degrees up to 39 degrees. And on Sysbench we get another 13% increase in performance, getting a total of 1173 events. The Pi still looks fine thermally, both in software and on the camera, so let's increase it to 2.3 GHz. To make this increase we need to enable Force Turbo. This improves stability by making your Pi run continuously at the set clock speed rather than dynamically adjusting the clock speed to match the workload. This setting voids your warranty though, and you're now obviously risking damage to your PAR. So don't do this unless you're prepared to potentially permanently damage your PAR, and don't leave your PAR running for long periods of time with this setting enabled. Now let's see if it still boots up. It has actually booted up now, so let's run the stress test and benchmark. At 2.3 GHz we get another temperature increase, but this time of only 1 degree to 40. In Sysbench we get a total of 1164 events, which is actually a slight decrease in performance over the 2.2 GHz result. I then went up in smaller increments, each time expecting the new frequency to be the last time that the power would boot up successfully. It did however boot and I ran the stress test and Sysbench at a range of frequencies from 2.35 GHz to 2.475 GHz. From 2.3 to 2.45 we had an average increase in performance of about 15%, but at 2.45 GHz I started noticing that the Pi was doing a few weird things. The cursor started flickering every so often, and at 2.475 GHz some of the files in the directories wouldn't show up. But in each case the power was still able to capture the screen contents, run the stress test successfully for about 2 minutes, and run the benchmark in Sysbench. I then tried 2.5 GHz, and since I hadn't expected the Pi to boot up beyond 2.3 GHz, I didn't have much hope for this. But after a brief boot screen, it did actually boot up into the desktop. But all wasn't well and the power was struggling. The first time it booted, I tried running the screen capture utility and it immediately locked up. I then decided to skip screen capture and just try running the stress test, and that too locked up. I then tried to just run the benchmark and even that locked up. So the power booted and was indicating that it was running at 2.5 GHz, but if I put any form of load onto it then it locked up. So that marked the end of my testing. I then had some fun playing around with the thermal camera. You can see from the thermal images of the Pi and Ice Cube cooler just how much better the resolution on a P2 Pro is compared to a slightly cheaper standalone camera. This camera only costs $60 less than the P2 Pro, and even combining a photo with a thermal image doesn't look nearly as good. Some other things that I found interesting under the thermal camera was how the surface mount components in the power circuit around the USB port start up in sequence when the Pi is powered up and also how quickly they cool down when the Pi is shut down. You can also watch the Pi boot up from the bottom of the board. As I mentioned earlier, thermal cameras can't see the temperature of metallic surfaces because they're reflective. But I wondered whether spraying the ice tower cooler black would mask the metal and allow the thermal camera to actually see the heat from the cooler. So I sprayed one of my coolers black for science. I 
I put it onto the Pi with some thermal compound and I booted up the cold Pi at 2 GHz. I left the camera recording for 2 minutes while running the same stress test. And you can now actually see the heatsink warming up. After 3 minutes I tried unplugging the fan. This led to a 10 degree rise in temperature over the next 3 minutes. And plugging it back in brought the temperature back down again. I'm curious to see if anyone else has managed to get a Pi 4 or even a CM4 or Pi 400 to boot up at 2.5 GHz or higher. And also whether you are able to run any tests on it. Let me know in the comment section below. Aside from the limitations in the power circuits, there is an element of silicon lottery involved. Some CPUs will be able to be overclocked higher than others. So there might be a couple out there that can go beyond 2.5 GHz. If you're interested in getting yourself a really small but powerful thermal camera that's great for getting up close with PCBs and small electronics, the P2 Pro is available from the Amazon stores in a range of countries. They're priced at $299. But if you order one using my coupon code in the video description, you can get $20 off your order. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more tech and electronics projects, tutorials, and reviews.